Hello everyone, this is Dr. Garima Sachdeva, one of the mentors of Study MRCOG and today's wisdom short will be on core surgical skills and postdoc care. So regarding what all important topics that we will be discussing, first one is laptoscopy and laptoscopy related injuries, then about hysteroscopy, then about postdoc ileus and Ogilvy syndrome, then about the enhanced recovery program. So this will cover most of the important topics in this module. So starting with laptoscopy. So for laptoscopy, uh, the entry points. So there are two methods of entry. One is the closed entry, also known as direct trocar or through Wheelie's needle. Second is open technique, which is also known as Hassan's technique. And what are the various points where you can enter? First one, the most commonly used is umbilicus. Then uh, you can enter through Palmer's point, which is 3 cm below the subcostal margin on the midclavicular line. Then third is a Li Huang point, which is in the middle of, if you join a line from ZB sternum to umbilicus, the midpoint of this will be Li Huang point. So most commonly we use this uh, umbilicus. However, if you are suspecting adhesions, or the patient is very thin or obese, then you can go for alternative entry points or for an open technique. Then what should be the pressure for pneumoperitoneum? So for pneumoperitoneum, for in, uh, like if you are inserting the trocar, whether it is a primary or a secondary trocar, then the, uh, the pressure should be around uh, 20 to 25 millimeter of mercury. And for performing the procedure, it should be around 12 to 15 millimeter of mercury. So this was about the laparoscopy and also what are the, like you I told you the most common point of entry is umbilicus. So but sometimes you find periumbilical adhesions if the patient is uh, like post-operative or otherwise also. So what are the percentages or what is the prevalence of adhesions? Like if it is a patient who has not undergone any surgery, then the prevalence of adhesions is around 0.68%. If patient has undergone any laparoscopic surgery, then it is around 1.6%. If the patient has undergone any uh, transverse uh, lip midline, uh, transverse laparotomy, then it is around 20% or 19.8%. If the patient has undergone any midline laparotomy, then it's more than 50%, around 52%. So this was about the laparoscopy, how to do and what are the various techniques then about the injuries so first we'll discuss about the vascular injury so the most common vessel which is injured is inferior epigastric artery and in order to avoid it the area which is safe which is considered safe for laparoscopic entry is uh, which has the least uh, vascular supply is within one centimeter of the midline or more than eight centimeter from the midline or there is something known as tinnelli's yellow island if you draw a line joining from uh, like umbilicus to the ASIS and divide it into two-third and one-third then that point is known as Tinnelli's yellow island so that is also safe area and has least risk of inferior epigastric injury and also to, pro uh, to avoid these vascular injuries you should insert the trocards while the patient is supine rather than in Trendelenburg position because the chances of injury are more in Trendelenburg position because of the position of the vessels. So this was about the vascular injury. Then coming over to the visceral injury. So the most common visceral injury is uh, the bladder injury. So bladder injury, uh, only 50% of the bladder injury is recognized in the intraoperative period. And while do, you are doing laparoscopy, the most common step which causes uh, bladder injury is when you are dissecting the bladder from the cervix. So that is the most important step. And what is the most important, most common site to be injured? It is in uh, like uh, at in the midline between in between the intertrochanteric bar. So this was about the bladder injury. And how do you recognize the bladder injury? So you recognize it by like. If you can see an obvious cystostomy or leakage of urine, or if you fee, see there is hematuria or air in the urobac, or if there is uh, this, um, if you inject, uh, do cystoscopy and inject methylene blue dye, and you are able to uh, make out the leakage of urine. Then coming over to the ureter injury, so 
like i told you like in case of bladder injury only 50% cases are recognized in draw however in ureteric only one third that is 33% of the cases are recognized in the intraoperative period and the most common uh, type of bladder inj- uh, of u- most common type of ureteric injury is transection and uh, the repair so for bladder injury we were just uh, suturing the bone edges using polygalactin 20 or 30 in case of ureteric injury there is a site specific repair so if it's injured at upper one third then you do ureteral ureterostomy if you if it is in, uh, there is injury between one third and two third you do either ureteral ureterostomy or uh, trans ureteral ureterostomy if it's in the lower third then you do a boaris flap or a uh, swas hitch or urate also known as ureterohemocystostomy then this was all about uh, the laparoscopy and related injuries now coming over to hysteroscopy so hist- for hysteroscopy the telescope that we use is most commonly used is 30 degree telescope it is 2.7 mm with a 3.5 mm sheath so uh, and for analgesia you can use nsaids opioids are not recommended nsaids you can use either paracetamol or ibuprofen one hour prior to the procedure cervical dilatation in general is not recommended for all cases and even cervical preparation is not recommended for all cases regarding the distension media so the two commonly used distension media for outpatient hysteroscopy are either normal saline or you can use uh, this uh, CO2 so if you ask me which is better then normal saline is better because it tears of the blood so vis- uh, the vision is better there is less risk of vaso vehicle reactions and all then coming over to the post op care uh, post op care the management of ureter and bladder injuries is the same as we have discussed with the post op laparoscopic injuries and bowel injury the uh, bowel there are two common complications with bowel one is post op ileus and the other is ocular syndrome so post op ileus uh, it is because of the non mechanical obstruction and mostly because of the electrical uh, light imbalances which occur which causes this uh, post op ileus where the patient has abdominal distension nausea vomiting and it is managed mostly by conservative uh, things like you put the patient in you give them iv fluids you can do a nasogastric decompression all this and if you do an x ray you can uh, diagnose it because there you will find gross dilatation of all the loops then obviously there can be obstruction and then coming over to ogilvy syndrome ogilvy syndrome basically it is due to the damage to the parasympathetic sacral nerve plaque plexus while doing any pelvic surgeries and as a result of which autonomic innervation to the bladder is affected and it causes particularly cecal dilatation and the management also depends on the how much the cecum is dilated if the dilatation is more than like 9 cm patient has uh, lactate levels are more acidosis or there is air under diaphragm then you go for straight away go for laparotomy you can try decompression initially but uh, if it's not getting relief then straight away laparotomy however if all these things are not there the diameter is less than 9 cm the patient is stable she doesn't have any respiratory complication she doesn't have any air under diaphragm or her lactate levels are normal then you can give give her conservative management like you can put her in you give her iv fluids and all that okay so then coming over to the last topic that is enhanced recovery so for enhanced recovery you should uh, be prepared while you are admitting uh, while you are planning the patient for the surgery so in the pre operative period like when, once you are counseling the patient for the surgery you should make sure that all her pre operative conditions are optimized like if she has diabetes or diabetes is controlled if she has hypertension it's under control if she has anemia then that's under control then if the uh, then the second thing is um, once you are admitting you should be like try to admit the patient on the same day of the surgery rather than keeping uh, keeping patients for long admissions then after admission like you don't keep her npo for a long time so for liquids it has been recommended two hours of npo is fine and carbohydrate preloading it decreases the hospital stay and you can give them complex carbohydrate drinks so this gives them energy and uh, avoids prolonged periods of npo so this also helps in enhanced recovery then uh, coming over to when you are doing a surgery so you should avoid putting ng tubes you should ideally uh, perform a minimal, minimally invasive uh, surgery uh, 
he then uh, keep uh, like uh, with proper care and uh, try to optimize the time for surgery keep everything ready then in the post op period you should avoid you should give adequate analgesia to the patient adequate pain relief is very important then uh, uh, you can give epidural if the patient want for pain relief and uh, you should plan early discharge for the patient so early discharge in the sense like if it's a small surgery you can discharge the same day or the next day then uh, like after discharge also you she should plan for a post op within 24 hours follow up so all these things if you keep in mind they will help the patient and enhance recovery so this was all about this uh, post op care and core surgical skill module um, i hope i have made things clear in case of any doubt you can get back to me thank you so much